Good evening, you're watching S3 TV News. Coming up, training and experience for the young in Grimsby, a new project seeks to provide help. And no longer even a single malt, the kilns are remembered in Louth. And here in the studio, I'll be talking to Richard and Donna Fell about the Josh Fell Cry Charity Fundraiser. Welcome to Estuary TV News. I'm Hugh Richards. First of all, it's over to Dan Kemp for the news headlines. Hello there. Women have been advised to wear a panic alarm due to a spate of alleged indecent assaults in the Beverly and Cottingham Road areas of Hull. In each instance, the man has approached women and allegedly tried to inappropriately touch them before running off. The vendor is believed to be around 5 feet 9 inches tall with a deep voice and didn't speak English. It's thought he may live off Newland Avenue in Hull and anyone with information is asked to contact Humberside Police. The Humber LEP have announced a new multi-million pound investment from a training provider that will help more local people to make the most of jobs created by wind energy companies coming to the area. Training provider AIS will create 30 direct jobs with the new centre that will train 15,000 people a year to work in the fast-growing wind sector. The centre will include a 30-metre turbine training tower and is expected to open in just 12 weeks. There is a risk that um, the new investors coming from overseas for this offshore wind sector will be um, employing people from outside the region or certainly from overseas and this um, investment essentially is to help us um, home grow our own um, labour pool to ensure that local people um, get those jobs in the new sector coming forward. A marathon which took place on Easter Sunday marked three years since a Hull man suffered a life-changing brain hemorrhage. Paul Spence ran a 26.2 mile run from Hull Royal Infirmary for his marathon challenge. Since the unprovoked attack which caused his hemorrhage, he has suffered confusion, cognitive difficulties and loss of memory. With the support of family, friends and staff at the hospital, he's rebuilding his life. He's raised £4,000 for Hull and East Yorkshire Hospital's NHS Trust, Neurosurgical Wards 4 and 40. On the last six miles of his route, he was joined by more than 70 friends and family members. Staff at Castle Hill Hospital have been nominated for an award thanks to their commitment to saving waste. A local team of NHS workers has been recognised for its work to reduce water consumption as part of their ongoing commitment to sustainability. The team will discover whether they've won at the NHS Stability Awards ceremony, which will take place on Thursday the 16th of April in London. And finally, Techni pop star Ella Henderson made a surprise appearance at a local charity over the Easter weekend. She visited St Andrew's Hospice with her mum and the 19-year-old has been a supporter of the charity for 10 years after the hospice cared for her grandfather in the final weeks of his life. He donated chocolate, eggs and signed autographs for patients. That's all from me for now. More from me soon. Young people have had a rough time throughout this recession. Companies have been unwilling to invest in training for new staff, which has meant too many people with no experience have been left behind as they look for a step onto the first rung of the employment ladder. A project in Grimsby is now trying to give them that step up, as James Dunn reports. Young people have had a rough time throughout the recession. Many companies have been unwilling to invest in training for new staff, which has meant too many people with no experience have been left behind as they look for a step onto the first rung of the employment ladder. It's very difficult knowing what you want to do and knowing what's out there, knowing where to go. Where to... Luckily, I found Cat Zero and, and found you know people who were there to who were able to progress my future. But Cat Zero is a new scheme praised by the government for thinking outside the box when it comes to getting young people into work. They're known best for taking participants on a boat trip at the end of the 12-week course. But last week, they took over a cafe in Grimsby's Freeman Street. It's a business marketing exercise. They actually organise the menus, print the menus. They decide what they're going to cook. They do the shopping. They work the kitchens. They act as waiters, waitresses. And we do this for local businesses. There's um, lots of opportunities out there for young people. And what we do with Cat Zero is try and make them more aware of what there is in the area. And setting up and running your own business is a great exercise, not only for building confidence, but it shows them that if they are challenged, they can achieve. The idea is to show young people just what they're capable of. The young people have so much potential, there's so many opportunities out there, and living so close, they don't actually see this. And what we do with Cat Zero is show them there is a different way of doing things. We try and open their eyes up. We take them out, we meet local businesses, make local people, 
and show them the opportunities out there. And we show them how to access this. And they've got some universal skills from the experience. What I feel I got out of today is if I want to go into that sort of industry, it'll help me get into that industry. It'll help me build the confidence with it. It allows me to talk to people and build the confidence with talking to people as well. Yeah, friends, amazing friends, amazing teamwork, confidence, you know, learning how to do different skills and um, just the support and creativity and just the fun and happiness that you get from going there every day instead of not doing, trying to look for a job, not doing anything, not knowing what to do, instead I can come here and... You're watching SGTV News. A little later, we ask another big question of some little kids. And Dan Kemp, at long last, is back to bring you all the sports news. Richard and Donna Fell set up a charity after their son Josh died at the age of 15 four years ago due to an unsuspected heart condition. The charity campaigns and raises money to provide heart screening to give warning of this otherwise unpredictable problem. Richard and Donna, thank you very much for coming in. First of all, let's just get the details of this fundraising day. When and where is it? Donna. Um, it is a Exhall City Tigers family football and charity um, fund day, um, which is going to be held at Hornsey on the Sunday the 3rd of May, starting from 10 o'clock, but kick-off is at 11 o'clock. OK, and how many people are you hoping to see there, Richard? Um, well, past experience, we've had around five or 600 people. Um, weather permitting, hopefully we get a lot more people and raise some vital funds. Now, a tragic thing, nothing more tragic, of course, to lose your son. I don't want to uh, take you back to such a horrible time uh, other than simply to explain what happened and how suddenly it happened. Donna, he was out playing football. Yeah, he went out as normal. Um, it was a Thursday night to meet with friends to play football. Um, he was late in. He hadn't come in. I tried ringing him and we realised that there was something wrong, so we went out to look. Um, we found that there was an ambulance at the school where he was playing football and that was it, you know. And you were in the ambulance with him and that's when you realised the seriousness of the situation? Yeah, yeah, um, I, I was only allowed to travel in the front um, and then it, it, it sort of like hit me hard realising there was something seriously wrong um, and then when we got to the hospital it was... That's yeah, when got the... It was unthinkable, yeah. Dreadful yeah, news. Yeah. Had there been any symptoms of anything wrong before? Nothing. Josh was a normal, fit 15-year-old boy. Never complained of anything. So, no, totally out of the blue. And you don't think of a 15-year-old lad as having heart problems when you're in your 70s and 80s and maybe you have mm. a vulnerable heart, but so there's no indication whatsoever that there's anything wrong. No, no symptoms whatsoever. It turned out to be uh, a sudden arrhythmic death syndrome caused death. Yep. What exactly is that, Donna? Um, it basically is to do with the electrical current in the heart and with Josh it sort of did a loop the loop and switched itself off and that was it. And His heart was absolutely healthy, nothing wrong, it was just all to do with the electrical current. And, and how common is this problem? Um, the, it, as they said, it, it was t 12 a week die from this condition or, or a few conditions of an umbrella term. But they're now saying that you're looking at 16 young people die a week. Uh, well, is the, re the reason it's going up is because the condition's becoming more common or because it's just been more frequently diagnosed? It's, it's, it's been more... Uh, the awareness is getting out there, we think, to, 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 your, to your doctors and your, your specialists, your consultants, um, which people that they're now seeing, oh, this isn't just a... I don't it's know. a flash in the pan, isn't yeah, it? There's yeah, a consistent pattern yeah, to be found yeah, here. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, how did you find out? How did you get this diagnosis? We had to wait four weeks um, for Josh's heart to come back from London where it was tested by the cardiac risk in the young team um, who are based down there. Um, but four weeks to wait to find out what your son died of was a bit of a nightmare. Now the cardiac risk in the young team, uh, the fact that that exists demonstrates that there is a problem here. Uh, is there any indication of what the causes are of this rather vaguely named condition? Um, fainting, blackouts, really, to do with the SADS term that we lost Josh through, but any, any palpitations, fluttering of your heart, feeling faint, blackouts, like I say, get them checked out because, you know, at the end of the day, 
it could be masking one of these hidden conditions. And, th and those are the indications. People could be suffering from this undiagnosed and vulnerable to just dropping down at any time, Richard. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just d don't take a chance. Even if, without scaring anybody, even if you think there's something wrong, keep on at your doctor. Don't, you just never know. But those are, those are the indications that you might be vulnerable to it, the, the backing out, the fainting, but is there any knowledge in the medical world of what might cause it? Because, again, so young, so healthy, uh, this isn't an old man, this isn't a fellow who's been smoking 20 cigars a day for the last 50 years or anything like this. Is there, what, what is the, 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 what precipitates this condition so suddenly? Or is there just no idea? Sometimes there's no idea, sometimes it's in genes and unfortunately it's, you know, goes on undiagnosed and mm. you don't find out until it, the Eight, worst yeah, happens. 80% of the cases are undiagnosed. Uh, and if it is diagnosed, and we'll get on to the importance of screening mm. and how you're promoting that, if it is diagnosed, then there's an opportunity to do something about it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And that's especially important, of course, in the young uh, in the age group that Josh was. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We'll come back and we'll talk about more about CRY and that fundraising event in a moment. Don't go anywhere else. They dominated Louth for 60 years, but the malt kilns were demolished back in January. They had divided opinion and were considered by many to be an eyesore. Now they're being remembered at a new exhibition in Louth at the museum, as Dave Nunn went to find out. Built in the 1950s, the malt kiln in Louth, the first of its kind in Europe, was demolished back in January. Now it's being remembered in a special exhibition at Louth Museum. Well, the exhibition is built around the model. It was made by John Hardy, who has uh, now died. When he died, his wife knew about the model and said that we ought to have it, together with all the photographs that were taken of the building um, and of its use. The model of the malt kiln is split into four parts and demonstrates the process of malting. What amazes me about it is what you can see inside. Um, obviously he, he knew the inside of the building and, uh, and, and built it round them. Um, you can um, put the whole thing together of course in the, into a unit but it's separated here into the, into the different sections of the malting, uh, the, the roasting, the uh, uh, with a combing of it, um, we, we've got a, a downstairs. We've got um, some parts of the old malting, including the huge um, wheel uh, that was used to uh, manoeuvre the um, malting right up to the top. And then it worked its way through the factory uh, and uh, out the bottom. The model not only serves as a reminder of a building now gone, but also a man at the heart of it. John Hardy built the model and was also the engineering manager when it closed in 1998. It serves as a fitting testament to him and the kiln, although some think it was a blot on the landscape. Oh, he'd be really uh, chuffed about it. The fact that we had brought it out, r arranged it, uh, and the, the volunteers have done remarkably well in placing it in the middle and then surrounding it by all the photographs of the, uh, as I say, of the building um, and the works inside and so on. Really quite remarkable, um, but a blot on the landscape is now gone. Richard and Donna Fell are still with me. Uh, your charity you set up specifically is to raise money for this organisation, Cry, isn't it? Yeah. So, so that's so Cry, you're slightly separate from Cry, but you're just feeding in your uh, the money that you can raise to, so that Cry can provide as much screening as possible. Yeah. Excellent. As we said, eighty percent of people. 80% uh, of these cases might go undiagnosed. I think there was a footballer, Richard. Yes, yeah, Fabrice Mwamba, um, used to play for Bolton. Um, some people might remember he collapsed on the pitch and he was very, very fortunate to have um, a doctor who was, I believe, watching the game. Um, they did work on him from the minute he dropped to the floor till, I don't, I don't know the length of time, but until he was in hospital and the, he was very, very lucky they brought him yeah. back. And he had, again, a professional athlete, absolutely no idea that there was anything. He played for Bolton, yeah. uh, no idea that there was anything wrong with him, and no. only because he happened to fall over during a professional football match, which was surrounded by doctors, did he, did he get lucky. Yeah. What happens with these cry screenings? What, what's the process? We have to um, book them, and it's usually a couple of years in advance. Um, they bring a team down 
it costs seven thousand pound for two days, um, which equates to thirty-five pound each person. So that's how many people you get through. We can screen up to two hundred over the days. two days. Um, and the people that you're targeting here, they're a particular age group. Age between fourteen and thirty-five. And that's thirty-five pounds just to check that the most fundamental and crucial organ in your body is working okay, it doesn't seem all that expensive. No, it doesn't. And it's just a simple ECG. And then if they do pick up on anything, then you go down and see the doctor there and then, and then he then refers you on for further tests if need be. So why do we need a charity to be raising money to do this when these people could be saved by a simple £35 test? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's down to... Well, it's the government again. Um, you shouldn't put somebody's life down to the cost of something, but unfortunately... Well, 16 a week is not... 16 deaths a week. You could yeah. just pay 35 quid yourself, couldn't you, if you had these fainting... Absolutely, you could. Yeah. Yeah. This, the, the, the day that you've got organised, it sounds absolutely brilliant, all sorts of events, uh, ex-Hull players having a charity match, uh, and you're going to be auctioning an important piece of football yes. history. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dean Wynn, that's his Wembley 2008 playoffs Man of the Match trophy. He's donated it to us so we can. Dean Wynn has it. played for Hull City. Yeah, yeah. And have this to is help me out with the sport this, really. he, yeah. He, this was a a big it's a big piece of memorabilia in in our eyes and in all City's eyes because it was the first time they went into the Premier League. And and he signed it. He signed it. Yep. And at the minute we've got a bid on it for three and a half thousand pounds. It um, should be said that it's a particularly interesting and genuine piece of history because it's clearly been used. It has, yeah, yeah. It's um, as I say, one previous owner, if you like. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's, it, it's it, an amazing piece it of history. It bears the marks of celebrations, doesn't yeah, it? it does, yeah. uh, and so you've got three thousand five hundred bid for it so far. When does bidding close? The bidding closes on the third of May at the charity match. Okay, so actually on the day itself. Yeah. And how can people bid for that and how can people come to the, the charity match itself? Uh, well, to bid on this, if you email me on richard.fell at brianfell.co.uk um, and I'll be switching my phone back on after the interview, so if anybody wants a bid. OK, <laughs> thank you very much, Richard and Donna. Just remind me of the date and the venue for the fundraising day. 3rd of May, um, which is a Sunday, and it's at Haunted Recreation Ground, which is just off Attic Road opposite the school, and it costs a pound for adults, 50p for children. All money raised goes towards future screening. Thank you very much, both of you. I think that's going to be a wonderful day. Thank you. We go over now to South Ferriby Primary School, where the pupils have the answers to all our social, economic and political ills. Another big question for little kids. Why do you think £8 an hour? Because it don't cost too much for the government and it don't cost too much for the council, but it's like fair for everyone. Three pounds, no, four pounds around that area. Do you think that's a fair amount? No, because say like if you've got a family of four and you're trying to get jobs like all over the place and the only job you can really get is a shop and that's like minimum wage and that's no good. I think at least £30 pound because it's a decent money and it's fair for everyone. Should the minimum wage be different for people with families and without families? Well, I know if I say like yes, it's going to be a bit of argument, but uh, I certainly think the shrimp be the same. Would you like it if it was £30 an hour? Yes. I would think at least it depends how hard you work. And if you don't work that uh, hard, you, you get uh, less, and if you work really hard, you get more. And football should get paid less, because all they do is just kick a ball. Why do footballers deserve to get paid a lot of money? Because, like, they can get injured, but they also, like, give people entertainment. How much do you think teachers get paid? A hundred a month. What do you think it should be? I think it should be around £5 
to 10 really, 10. 20 pounds. Where would you say on that scale? Where do you think it should be? I think it should be about 10. Really. How much would you do it for? What's the least amount you would do it for? 10 pounds. No. Our long wait is over. Dan Kemp is back with the sport. Grimsby Town remain three points behind the conference Premier leaders Barnet, having scored two second half goals at Alfreton yesterday. Josh Gowling and Lanell John Lewis netted for the Mariners, who have just three games remaining to chase down the one automatic promotion spot, having also drawn two all with Gateshead on Saturday. Hull City's Premier League place for next season is starting to look more and more under pressure following the side's 3-1 defeat at Swansea City at the weekend. The Tigers had gone down 2-1 before half-time before Paul McShane pulled the goal back but David Myler was sent off and Baffa Tembi Gomez rounded off the scoring in South Wales. They're now just two points above the drop zone. Scunthorpe United eased their relegation fears with their first win in 10 on Saturday by winning 2-0 at home to Peterborough. Strikers Paddy Madden and Theo Robinson with the goals. And North Ferrum United hopes of following their FA Trophy success with a playoff berth appear to be over after back-to-back -back Easter defeats to Chorley and Harrogate Town. In ice hockey, Hull Stingrays captain Matty Davis has said he's full of pride following the side narrowly missing out on reaching the Elite League playoff final. The Rays were within four seconds of taking their semi-final spot against the Sheffield Steelers to overtime, but Jason Roy struck a controversial winner to end Hull's pursuit of the trophy. And in Rugby League, both Hull FC and KR picked up victories yesterday. The Black and Whites bounced back from their Derby Day defeat to win at reigning champion St Helens 28-20, which included two tries by fullback Jamie Shaw. And Hull KR won 2016 at home to the Huddersfield Giants, featuring a try and two goals by Josh Mantelato. The Robins are now up to fourth in Super League, whilst the FC are 11th, but just four points behind their city rivals and don't forget Scunthorpe are back in action tonight against MK Dons and that's all for the sport. Uh, thanks just before we go to David Robinson who we saw earlier for some help with our What You Save feature. Last week we were talking about a croggy and we suggested I'm afraid that it might come from BMX culture. Apparently it's a much more ancient Lincolnshire word and it's to do with the crossbar of a bicycle so that if you have a chap sitting on front of the crossbar and you're giving him a, read, uh, a ride apparently that's a croggy. Uh, uh, thank you very much for a long email. If you have a story for us, please go to our Facebook or Twitter pages. Details are on the screen. Email news at estuary.tv. You know what the phone number is, Grimsby 31553. Until tomorrow, good evening. Estuary TV's weather, sponsored by Hornsby's, celebrating 100 years in buses. Hello and welcome to Estuary TV's weather. The fine weather continues through Wednesday with again some early fog clearing, temperatures still reaching the mid-teens and light winds again will make it feel pleasantly warm in the sunshine and a maximum temperature of 16 degrees. And Thursday will be fine and warm. Estuary TV's weather, sponsored by Hornsby's, celebrating 100 years in buses.